Well, good. Jesus is awesome. And he's wonderful. God bless you. Please be seated. Oh, man. Can you believe Jesus wants to hang out with us for all eternity? Well, I can get tired of people in two or three days. <laughs> but he wants to hang out with us for eternity. Wow, isn't he wonderful? Honestly, think about Jesus. He's altogether lovely. No one like him. He's uh, beautiful beyond description. He's marvelous, isn't he? He really, really is something. He's God. Uh, only way to heaven. So anyway, we're going to have to talk about some things today. I want to do something. I want to encourage you to pick up these messages that uh, Pastor Sweet was talking about. Listen, uh, we've got recording stuff. It's, it, it, you can't buy stuff for what he's trying to sell. I'm, I'm telling you, that's giveaway prices. But get those messages. I'm telling you, because you can't comprehend it all sitting in here. But you can get there at your house. You can turn it up, turn it on. And uh, you'll, you'll go, I didn't even hear that. Isn't that, isn't that something? Okay. Is this okay? Can you all hear? No. I, 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 they'll, they'll cut me off and I won't be able to say anything. Uh, here's what I'm going to talk about today. You ready? Yes. I'm talking about your geographical will of God. Are you in the geographical will of God for your life? See, if you're not where you're supposed to be, there's no grace to be where you are. If you are not where you're supposed to be geographically, there is no grace to be where you are. Some of you will have to pack up and move to different locations after the message because uh, <laughs> some of you are not in the right place. You're not in the place of your anointing. Once Rick Joyner carried me over there to uh, England and uh, he says, now we're going to go meet a, 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 a pastor. Uh, and, and he says, uh, he, I, here's what Rick told me. He said, Bobby, I want you to be really keen. This man needs a word from the Lord. So I said, okay. The, the pastor was going to be gracious enough to let us in his house. So we go up there. I'd never met him before in my life. Rick rings the doorbell. Pastor comes. They greet one another. We go in. The pastor's there, and he's a wonderful uh, man. And so uh, his houseboy, his, the, his servant comes in to bring us some tea and some uh, scones. Now, what is a scone? It's, it's a hockey puck uh, <laughs> disguised as a biscuit. That's what it is. But listen, but anyway, so they brought in some of that. And so we talk with the pastor there maybe 45 minutes. And finally... Rick looks at me and says, well, Bobby, God showed anything for Roger? I said, nope, he sure didn't, but he showed me something for that houseboy. Get him back in here. <laughs> so the houseboy came back in there and he's standing at the door going into the kitchen. And I said to him, hey, you go back to your father's house. This is not the house of your anointing. Go back to your father's house. Wow, so he left this uh, ministry that he was with, went back to his father's house there in uh, Switzerland, and now he's pastoring what is the church that his father has built, and it's just marvelous. It's wonderful it, that we do some of the largest conferences there. Thousands of people come to a conference in Switzerland. That's amazing, isn't it? Because this boy got out of where he wasn't supposed to be and got in where he was supposed to be, and the anointing came. Yeah. They have a ministry called Slifle. Isn't that some Slifle means the sharpening shed. And so you believe we need to sharpen some swords? Yes. The Bible said when it came time for Israel, to go to battle, there was not found a sword or a spear in the hands of the warriors because the Philistines had removed the smiths from the land. You know what this church is? It's a blacksmith shop. Yeah. You're, you're, you're forging swords and spears for the young champions. It says when it came time for Israel to go to battle, there was not found a sword or a spear in all of Israel because the Philistines, the enemies of God, had removed the smiths from the land. So when, when you hear teachings like you've been hearing, it's, it's forging swords and spears for the hands of the, the champions. Don't you want that? Yeah. So that's what you're doing. So I, I've, I've told him twice uh, what he's doing. I told him he's a voice of one in the wilderness crying to appear the way of the Lord. Isaiah 43 through 5. So anyway, when you hear me prophesy, I never go, Thus saith the Lord unto thee. I don't let anybody in my team prophesy like that. Most of the time that's a religious spirit attempting to wow you. 
If God's got something to say to you, He'll say it to you, and you'll be the only one in the house who knows it's a real word from God. Most time, a prophetic word is just actually God reinforcing what He's already told you. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if I, when I'm getting to talking, you better get to listening because I'm telling you, it's amazing. It, I'm telling you, uh, we're here to talk to you about destiny. And God, I'm going to talk to you about uh, being in the geographical will of God. I don't know, and something's on me. Look at that. I don't, <laughs> good Lord, I guess it's, yeah. that some, and did, you know, I bought me a silk shirt one time. Uh, you thank you. Carolyn bought, bought me a. <laughs> I'd have bought a camel if I'd have been buying it. Camel shirt. I don't know what that is. Anyway, thank you. I bought me, uh, my wife got me one of these silk shirts one time. And it's a Wednesday night uh, prayer meeting teaching at our church. And I just got me this new red felt pen to write in my Bible. And I've been in the study writing some notes. And I popped it in my pocket. I get back out there and I noticed everybody's looking at me like, <laughs> what had happened? I didn't have the cap on good and it's sucking through this oh. silk shirt. Looked like it had been shot in the chest. <laughs> yeah. Now, you got time for a, a little bit of humor and uh, it'll help you. A merry heart does good like a medicine. Now, you know, uh, husbands, they listen to their wives, but sometimes they, they just listen, but they don't hear. So uh, I used to teach a Sunday school, uh, I used to teach a sanctuary, sanctuary class in our church and it had about 700 people in it and then we'd teach it on Sunday morning and then let them out and so the, 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 you know, the rest of the people could come in. So my wife would go to church early to greet the people. So here, here we are on a Sunday morning. We're at our home and we're at the, my closet and my wife is saying, Bobby, Wear this suit, do not wear that suit. Both of them are blue pinstripe suits. Both of them are identical in color. And she said to me, Bobby, wear this suit, do not wear that suit. And I, I'm, I'm going, no, no, okay. And so she goes on to church. I finish up some stuff. I take my shower. I get I'm getting fixing to get dressed. And I go, which one of them suits was it? <laughs> And then I thought, well, shucks, it couldn't make any difference. They're both uh, blue pinstripe suits. So I threw it across the bed, and I put my foot in one of them, put my foot in the other, pulled them up, and I thought, good Lord. I mean, they button real good. You know what I thought? I thought these rice cakes are working, you know. <laughs> those things, it buttoned really good, and so I thought, whoo, I must have lost a little weight or something. So I go ahead and put my shirt on, my tie, and all that, stuff my things, buckle my belt. And so I get my coat. I didn't want to put my coat on because I'm going to be preaching to about 700 people. And I don't get sweaty because then church is about to happen. So they're all in there, the sanctuary class. So I come in the side door. I come in. I got my coat over my little, my shoulder. And so there's a lady there named Pam. And when I walk by Pam, I notice Pam did like this. So I thought, wow, they must be an anointing on me. <laughs> so I hung my jacket up like this on, on a clothes tree there in the sanctuary. So I start teaching. And I'm noticing everyone's while Pam's looking. I thought, wonder what it is. I thought, boy, I've got her attention. And I preached for about, I guess, what, 40 minutes, something like that. And it's time to dismiss. So I said, everybody bow your head. And even when I'm preaching, I'm thinking, man, these pants feel good. You know? <laughs> anyway, everybody bow your head. They all bow their head. The moment the last amen was said, Pam jumps up from her chair. She runs up to me and she says into my ear, Pastor. I said, yes. She said, there's something white hanging out the back of your pants. <laughs> The back of my pants didn't even have a back. <laughs> what had happened was I had two suits and my wife, my older son, was going to graduate from high school and they needed a suit. So she carried my suit to the tailor and they took out all the back seam, you know. <laughs> and was going to go measure my son so they could take the suit up to fit him. And I had no back. The tail was a... 
the white shirt was hanging out like a, yeah. I screamed, sing, I'll be back. I'm telling you, when they say wear this suit, don't wear that, you better find out what's going on. Good, good gracious. You know, I got, I got some stories that you couldn't hardly believe. Now, Joe, who, Brother Sweet and him has always put us in a nice hotel when we come. Used to, uh, you know, listen, you'd be putting some pretty rough, sometimes you'd have to stay with the pastors, you know. So I'm off down in a place, and the, there, the church is right there, and I'm staying in the pastor's home in a guest room. Uh, and so they've already gone to the church. And uh, now come with me. I've just finished my shower. I'm a guest in their home. I've just finished my shower. I'm going to get dressed for Sunday service. And that's me opening the medicine cabinet, snooping around. And... The pastor's wife is a nurse, and up there in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom was a bunch of pill bottles. So, I don't, this is stupid. <laughs> I'm reading the pill bottles, and I get to one over here nearly the end of the thing, and I pull it down, and it says, water retention. I said, bless God, that's my problem. I got water retention. <laughs> so, I read on there. And it says, take one. And so I opened them up, and they was about the size of a, a match head. Little bitty, little bitty things and little bitty uh, pills. So me being brilliant like this, I said to myself, I'm about four times bigger than her. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put, I'm taking four of these. Now, th I'm just telling you, man. I popped in four of these water retention pills, took me some water. Oh, Lord. I walked out there to go from the parsonage to the church. They're singing, you know, and I go, good Lord, I got to go. Listen. I want you to know something. Time those pills got through, I looked like a gutted snowbird, man. Now, nobody in their right mind is going to take somebody else's... See? I told you I'm spontaneous. You know what I mean. Good gracious. Paul Keith says there's angels up there hollering, tag me out. I've been too long with Bobby, you know. Okay. All right. We want to find out about finding the perfect will of God for your life, to being in the right geographical place. I want to give you a verse, 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11 verse 1, it says, When it came time for the kings to go to battle, David tarried still in Jerusalem. That was not where he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be leading the armies of God. But David tarried still in Jerusalem. He's not where he's supposed to be, so there's no grace for him to be where he is. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. He's supposed to be out leading the armies. He decided, determined, he's king. He can do whatever he wants to. I'm tarrying still in Jerusalem. So the armies go off. And you know, when you're not where you're supposed to be, there's no grace to be where you are. One of the first ways it manifests itself is discontentment. Discontentment. It says, and David was discontented. It says he got up off of the bed and started walking on the top of the roof. Here's the, here's the title of my message today. Stay off the roof. <laughs> Stay off the roof. It says David wasn't where he's supposed to be, no grace to be where he was. So he's discontented. He's not where he's supposed to be leading the armies of God. So he's discontented. He gets up off of his bed, and it's his own palace. He had it built. He knows all the architectural structures of it. So this is not something that just happened. It seems to be that uh, it's a, a well-laid snare from the devil. So it says David walked on the roof of the house.
And he walked over and looked over the balcony down to the bathhouse. Oh, and he said there was a, the Bible said there was a very beautiful woman there named Bathsheba. Wow. And here's what happens. It says, and David looked. It says, and David saw. One translation said, and David looked. Now listen, guys. You better guard your eyes. Your eyes is the quickest pathway to your heart. Guard your heart with all diligence because out of your heart will be the manner you live. But the quickest pathway to pollute your heart is your eyes. So guard your eyes. The Bible said Psalms, 100 and, and, uh, Psalms 101. We've got to guard our eyes. And so anyway, here's what happened. It says, and David looked. Uh, dare you look at that word look in Hebrew. It's the strong, one of the strongest words for lust. And David looked as Bathsheba was bathing. Now let's talk to you women just a moment. The Bible says you are supposed to dress in an appropriate way. Now, I know she was going to bathe, swim. You know, we'd, we'd say she was in the hot tub. But there she is, scantily clad. The Bible talks about that. The Bible says, do not adorn yourself in a lascivious way. I've seen women come in the house of God that, uh, I mean, listen, no, their, their apparel was not even close to being godly. And don't, don't, and I'm talking men and women both. Don't do anything lascivious. The word lascivious that causes the other, other sex to lust for you. Wow. Don't do it. Don't do it. Now, isn't it strange how we've adopted some uh, new language? We say, well, so-and-so had an affair. God don't call it an affair. He calls it adultery. Do you understand that? But see, we come up with these words that seem so benign. We, we say, well, I'm in love. God calls it lust. We got to get this thing straightened out. We call it a gay lifestyle when God calls it a pouring. Isn't that crazy? Wow. I, I, I don't know how the church can be so desensitized to the culture we're living in. I'm telling you, we're drowning in a, a culture of compromise, thinking, well, you know, uh, we're more enlightened now. You can't call that enlightened. The Bible says, if the light that be in you be darkness, how dense is that darkness? That's the verse in the Bible. If the light that be in you be darkness, how dense is that darkness? Wow. If the light... That being you be darkness. How dense is that darkness? Jesus. See, some people have just enough knowledge to be dangerous. Mm. Yeah. They don't really know about sanctification and being holy and pure. Well, you know, I joined the church. <sighs> that's noble, but that's not going to get you to heaven. Yeah. I've been christened, sprinkled, confirmed. All of that's all right. None of it will get you to heaven. You've got to be born again, a new creation in Christ to get to heaven. Yeah. That's what Jesus told Nick. Remember Nick? Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. What in the heck does that mean? It meant he could quote the first five books of the Bible. It meant he kept 480 Levitical laws a day. Religious, but he didn't know, did he? And he thought he could use human, intell human intellectuality to figure out spiritual principle. Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nick goes, what? You mean I have to enter a second time into mommy's tummy? And Jesus said this, marvel not. The word marvel not means quit attempting to use human intellectuality to figure out spiritual principle. Most people going to hell never intended to go there. There's not, a, I've never talked to anybody that said, well, I'm going to hell. No, no, nobody intends to go there. But I'm telling you, you know what you got to do to go to hell? Nothing. Stay just like you are. You're born in sin. You go out of the mother's womb speaking lies. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Brother Joe Cole quoted, All we like sheep have what? See, all, now listen, let's get this straight. Bobby Connor didn't say babies are going to hell. I said, all you've got to do to go to hell is stay just like you're born. A baby is safe. They don't make a choice. But you've made a choice. God said, I've set before you death and life, blessings and curses. Choose life. 
I've had people try to trap you with these little theological games they play. They go, well, okay. If God is so sovereign and God is so powerful, why don't he make everybody get saved? He certainly could. But he wants volunteer lovers. He wants people that choose him. This whole thing's about choice. No human being will ever go to hell and point their finger at God and go, you never gave me a choice. Every person in the earth has had a choice. The Bible said there's a witness without and a witness within. Witness within is Holy Ghost. Witness without is created nature. That's right. Anyway. So there's David. He looks at this woman and uh, he could have went, ooh. Guys, have you learned how to protect your eyes? Says he looked at her instead of going, ooh. He went, mmm. World of difference, isn't it? World of difference. And it says he, you don't see it? Second Samuel. Here we go. Verse 4, and David sent a messenger and took her. We would say he got online. <laughs> you better stay off the internet, get off the roof. You'd be surprised how many people in this room right now, they, they troll the internet. Let me tell you something. You don't have to look for pornography now. It's trailing you. It's predatory now. You're very, it's dangerous to let your kids stay on the computer. It's dangerous for you to stay on the computer. You say, oh, listen, brother, I'm, a cons I'm an adult. I can handle it. No, you can't. You could not imagine the people addicted to pornography that sit inside the house of God. Wow, as a man thinks, that's how he's going to live. Let me tell you about this once. You want to hear a story? Yes. I'm in a coliseum, big old coliseum. There's a man right there standing in front of me. There's his wife and two or three children on a ministry platform just like this. I don't know, 10, 12, 15,000 people out there. So there he is. The Lord said, this man is addicted to pornography. I turned my mic off so nobody could hear me. I went to this side of his ear so his wife and children couldn't hear me. And I whispered to him, I said, sir, I am so sorry, but the Lord has, convict, has convinced me and shown me you're addicted to pornography. He and I are the only one who hears a conversation other than God. Guess what he does? He stiffens like a board and screams out loud, I'll have you to know I'm an elder in so-and-so's church, and I'm not addicted to pornography. Out of my mouth came these words, Well, whose DVD is that in magazine under the spare tire of your car? Pastor gets up, walks up there to the elder, and says, give me the keys to your car. Right. Went out to the parking lot, opened the trunk, pulled up the trunk. There underneath the spare tire was terrible, dirty videos and all kind of... See, that man would not have had to go on through that if he'd have just said, oh, please pray for me. There's always a way up and out of any pit you fall into if you're willing to confess your sin. Now, I'm telling you what, thank God, God, uh, God, they surrounded himself with the other elders and they were able to really put him under uh, real prayer and got him through this mess. But guys, I'm telling you, whatever comes through these gates, your eye gate and your ear gate is going to get down here. And when it gets down here, pretty soon it'll be coming out here. As a person thinks, that's how they're going to live. Look at David. Your Bible you hold in your lap says... He is a man after my own heart. That's what God said about him. That's what God said about him. And then they rehearsed it in the book of Acts. Here's a man after God's own heart. And now he's taking another man's wife, having intercourse with her, getting her pregnant, and is going to have her husband murdered. Is this right? Yes. Is it in the Bible? Yes. See, I want you to get something down. There is a high cost for low living. Yes. The Bible said, God told David, David, the sword will never leave your house. Boy, you look at the tragedies and the traumas that happened in this man's life, a man who was after God's own heart. Don't you? Now, how did he get exposed? Nathan the prophet. I want to thank God. God is raising up prophetic voices that will confront carnality at the highest level. Amen. We need it, don't we? Yes. 
Nathan, remember God showed him all of this and Nathan goes to King David. Now King David could have had him beheaded, but he, he gave him a story. Remember he gave him that story? He says to David, David, there's a little poor family over there and they, they, it was just tragic. They had no food and hardly anything to live off, but they had a baby lamb, a pet lamb. Said it was like one of their daughters. Said they would cuddle it and play with it. It said it was like one of their children. And a big rich guy came through, could have bought anything, bought herds of lambs if he wanted to, but he went and took that one and had it killed for a meal. Wow. And David pronounces judgment, doesn't he? And Nathan points his finger at the king and says, David, thou art the man. Wow. Let me tell you about one little moment of pleasure. There's a high cost for low living. And here's what happened. You ought to read Psalms 30 when David says, There's no soundness in my flesh. All night long my body roars. Does that sound like a guy having a good time? No, no then there's Psalms 51. You say, well, what's all this about? I want you to be in the right place doing the right thing. Our friend Bob Jones, you've heard a lot about him uh, during this conference, and I'm so thankful. Bob Jones told me a story once about a number, 341. Bob told me, he said, uh, it, boy, he always was a stickler for the number 341. So I told him, I said, why is that number so special to you, Bob? He said, well, well, he said, well I'll take it. He said, I went into a trance. He said, a trance more real than me and you here. Said, and uh, the Lord had prepared a table. There was a table there, and all the plates were turned upside down. And the Lord pulled out the chair and said, Bob, have a seat. He said, I sat down at this chair, and there was a table setting, all beautiful, but all the plates were turned upside down. And the Lord told him, said, Bob, turn your plate over. And Bob turned his plate over. There on this uh, plate was a check. The check number was 341, and it was signed in the blood of Jesus. And Jesus told Bob Jones, anytime you see that number 341, you are in the right place for the right reason. You can write a spiritual check for anything you want. So I thought, boy, uh, that sounds good. I get, right after that conversation with Bob Jones, I, I get on a plane that week to fly out to uh, the Northwest out there. And the pastor picked me up from the airport and was driving me to a, a hotel. And he said, uh, Bobby, I was going to put you over there in that hotel, but uh, I noticed they were having some kind of a, a convention, a Shriners convention or something, so did, I didn't want to put you over there, so I put you in this hotel. I'm joking. I said, oh, don't worry. My room number will be 341. <laughs> we get there, and the lady hands me the key. It's 341. <laughs> Pastor's waiting for me down in the lobby, so we're going straight from the lobby to a, a, a restaurant, a place to eat. I'm not opposed to that. <laughs> So we get in the car, and I'm still going to joke about 341. So when we get to the restaurant, we order something, and when the little waitress is coming bring the ticket, I said to the pastor, I bet you anything, the number on that ticket is going to be 341. The little waitress came up and set that pl plastic thing down and flopped that thing open. There it was, 341. <laughs> then the Lord said to me, don't you ever joke about this number again. Wow. So if, when I see 341, I'm in the right place for the right reason. Yeah. You ought to think about it. Now, can, can I give you a story about 341? I was up there in uh, Albany, Oregon with Denny Klein, Pastor Denny Klein, and me, and me and Denny and Bob Jones and his wife at that time was Viola. And so Bob and Viola was in the back seat asleep. And we're driving down the freeway. Denny Klein's driving. I'm sitting over there. And Denny's a pastor at one of the vineyard churches there. And so Denny had never heard the stories about 341. Me and him are driving. Bob and Viola are asleep in the back seat. And so I'm telling the story to Denny about Bob's 341. And we're going down the freeway there. And all of a sudden when I said, yeah, when, when you see the number 341, Bob says we're in the right place for the right reason. And so help me God. 18-wheeler uh, come by us and nearly blowed the off the road and on the side of the truck letters bigger than this screen 341 so isn't that something you couldn't you couldn't or Steven Spielberg couldn't have orchestrated that <laughs> so here's what happened Bob and Viola wake up in the back seat and Bob goes well let's see how I can say he said I need to go to the men's room Danny said well we're not around any station but up the road is a, a Rest stop. 
So we go up there, turn the blinker on, turns into a rest stop. Bob and Viola go out uh, to the washroom. Hit a little while, maybe, I don't know, two or three minutes. They come back and get in the car. And I'm telling Bob, I'm saying, Bob, I was telling Denny about your 341 thing and you're not going to believe it. And Denny's trying to pull his car out on the freeway. And I'm telling Bob about the 341. And guess what? A, a big car horn blows. <laughs> guess what it is? It's that truck 341 going by us while I'm telling the story about it. Wow. wow. That'll kind of give you the willies. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want people that can't feel God. I can show you in the Bible where it says, and God moved in such a way it made the hair on me crawl. That's in the Bible. Yeah. Isn't that something? You get around God, it'll change you. I prophesied the desert storm war uh, six months before it would start, and I, went there, I, I did it because I went there. When I came back, I was changed, and they caught it on television. My, my skin didn't even feel like human skin. It felt like an inflated basketball. Now, you can get it. It was on television footage. We prophesied the day and the hour the desert storm war would start six months before it started. Wow, good gracious. See, God won't do anything without telling the prophets. That's what we learned that yesterday, didn't we? But are you in the right place? You say, well, Bobby, how can I know I'm in the right place? Number one, are you obeying God? See, a lot of people are confused because they won't take step one and they're waiting on step two. God won't waste his time like that. If you will not obey step one, you can forget step two. God don't grade on the curve. He wants you to obey Him. Are you following the Holy Spirit? We got to follow the Holy Spirit. We got to follow Jesus in the way. That's why those teachings are so important that Joe and Sadhu's doing. We've got to learn how to say, Not my will be done, thy will. We've got to say, Oh God, I, I didn't even want to do this, but you've asked me to do it. Once I was in Tyler, Texas, uh, Tyler, Texas, and the Lord said, Go to Turkey, I'll speak to you. I said, God, speak to me in Tyler. <laughs> he said, go to Turkey. So I had to go to Turkey. That's a wild trip, man. I went to the seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation for the Lord to speak to me. Wow. I'm going up a, a hill from one of the, out in the mountains from one of those church sites. My wife, the car was parked here, and I'm, I'm to, told to go around this way. She said, I'm going to go this way. It's shorter. I said, okay. But I'm walking the other way. And here comes a turtle walking down the trail, 12 o'clock at noon. And he's walking down the trail on this mountain in Turkey. And he's about this big around. Not quite as big around as a garbage can lid, about that tall. And he's walking like this down the trail. Lord said, you see that turtle? I said, yes. He said, I want you to pick up that turtle, and there's an ancient spirit living in it. I want you to cast it out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I picked up this turtle. I got him eyeball to eyeball, head about that big around. And so I, ca I, I said, I take authority over any ancient spirit in here. So help me God, an airplane taking off the runway couldn't roar any louder than this turtle. <laughs> It, there was a herd of goats up on the top of a mountain. It scared them so bad. They ran down, jumped in the house, stuck their head out the windows. <laughs> but this turtle roared, roared, and finally quit roaring. God said, okay. I set him down. He went one way. I went the other. But turkey, what you've got to do is obey God. Yes. I don't care whether you don't want to do it. You want to hear another one? Yes. I'm in Tyler, Texas again. And the Lord said to me, won't you go to London? He didn't say, I want you to go. He said, go to London. I said to him, why? <laughs> he said to me, because you're told to. So I bought me a ticket from Dallas, Texas to London. Now, I'm mad. I had conferences to go to. Uh, now I've got to explain, well, I can't come. God told me to go to London. Well, anyway, I get off the plane. I'm mad. <laughs> Lord said, check in that hotel. I said to him, why? Because you're told to. I check in the hotel, I'm still mad. I get my room, I own the room, there's a leather chair over there against a brown wooden wall, and the Lord said to me, sit in that chair. I said to him, how long am I going to have to sit there? He said, till I tell you to get up. Come to London, sit in that chair with me a moment. 
I sat down in that leather chair, big old thick brown leather. There's a wooden wall right here, some hotel in London. I got my hands on each side of the arms like that. I, I wish I could tell you I was praying in tongues. Shut out of my kiss, shitty boy. I wasn't. I'd made up my mind, I'm going to glare across this room. I'm just going to sit here to see what will happen. I don't know how long I sat there. I sat there quite a while. And then something happened. I'll tell you what happened. Shoom! The wooden wall parted just like this. Now there's a gate and an entrance. Out of that gate and entrance walked into my room and they stood in front of me. I won't say they saluted me, but they acknowledged me. They come and stand in, my, in front of that chair. When they step in front of that chair, I know everything their life accomplished from the time they were born again till they went to heaven. Person after person after person after person walked by me. When they walked by me, I had divine knowledge of everything their life accomplished. And the last one came through was Jesus Christ. He said to me, you're here because they're there. It was a great cloud of witnesses. Walked through my hotel room in London, England. I am telling you, the greatest intercessory team you've got praying for you is the cloud of witnesses. They're praying that you'll succeed because they don't succeed full reward till you get yours. Amen. That's in the Bible. Wow. When Jesus stood there, he said, you're here because they're there. I'm telling you, listen, we've got to realize God won't waste our time if we won't waste his. We've got to learn how to redeem the time, make full use of every opportunity. Ephesians 5, 14 through 18. We've got to walk with goal, aim, and true purpose. We've got to make sure we're in the will of God where we're supposed to be. Have you ever been told to do something and you didn't think there was any need to do it? All right. Here I am. I'm driving down a road. I'm driving down a, a, a small Texas road. I'm in a suburban. I'm going the speed limit. There's a red light up there, but it's green. Now, you can go on green, you know. So I'm looking, I'm trying to drive safe. And so we're at an intersection, it's up there. And so I'm driving along there. I get closer to the intersection, light's still green. And the Spirit of God screamed at me and said, Stop! So I slammed on the brakes. And a, a truck goes, boom! A log truck ran the, red, ran the red light. What if I'd have said, Well, I don't want to stop, my light's green. Yeah. <laughs> You better do what God tells you. I'm sure to kill me, mangle me. See if we'll obey him, we'll be in the right place for the right reason. You see that? You go, well, you know, uh, I don't think God talks to me like that. Yeah, he does. But you're dull of hearing. That's what it says. My people, their hearts are so waxed, they're dull of hearing. You need to pray, Matthew 13, 16, and 17. That verse says, blessed are your eyes, they see, and blessed are your ears, they hear. And start speaking that you can perceive and receive communication from God. John 10, 27 says, my sheep will hear my voice. Not could, they will. You want to hear them, don't you? How many of you in this room want to start seeing angels? How many of you watching by network want, want to see angels? Start praying the prayer that was prayed in 2 Kings 6, 16 and 17. The prophet prayed, oh Lord, open his eyes that he might behold. And he saw in the realm of heaven. Wow. See, there, there's so much more to the spirit realm than just a Sunday morning in church. Yes. Yes. I was preaching the other day, and I, my hand, I'd, I'd hit something. And it, now this is a poor example, but hey, you know what saran wrap is? Yes. It felt just like saran wrap. I said, Lord, what in the world is this? He said, it's a membrane. It's a membrane between this world and the spirit world, and it's thinner than it's ever been. You can get into the realm of the spirit. How do you do it, brother? You want to know? Yes. Did you read Revelations 3.20? Revelations 3.20, Jesus talking, says, Behold, observe, look, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice. Now, any of us and all of us can hear the knock, but the knock is to tell us somebody's at the door. Then we've got to listen for the voice. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And then you read that. Then you says, I'll sit with him, him with me. But anyway, then, then Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 says, And after this, 
I heard a voice which said, come up here. And I looked and there was a door, a gate, a portal standing open in heaven. Access to that door happens when you open your door. I heard the knock. I opened the door. Remember that? Yes. After this, I heard a voice. And remember that? He said, come up here. And he got caught up into heaven. He saw this thing, saw that thing. You can get caught up into heaven. You can. Wow. Paul said he did. The Bible said the things that are revealed belong to us and already sent us from now on. If it's revealed in the Bible, it belongs to us. Where's that at, brother? Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our descendants from now on. That we might do all the bidding of this word. So anyway, one of the, one of the things we've got to do is have a, a holy hunger to get closer to God. Get closer to God. You don't hear when Jesus came to my house? Yes. All right. This is absolutely true. Uh, 1990 something a man asked my wife said do you think if I built a cabin here in Moravian Falls Bobby would come she said I don't know you'll have to ask Bobby so this man came and asked me said Bobby if I build a cabin here uh, will you come and stay some I said I don't know I'll have to ask Jesus so I asked Jesus if he, and he said yes so I told the man yes they built a cabin tens of thousands of people have seen this cabin because of what I'm going to tell you about it the, they built a cabin, a nice little cabin up in the woods. Wasn't any houses built there on this property then. Matter of fact, when the man was going to buy the property, he brought me and my wife onto that property. He said, now, we're going to ask God for a, a sign to see if this is what we're supposed to build. So we're there, and I see an angel jump from one tree to another, and then he hid himself in that tree. So I said, I saw an angel jump from this tree to this tree, but now he won't show himself. So let's ask for a sign. So I said, Lord... Give us a sign. When I said sign up the hill, up the side of the mountain, a wind comes. Trees are this big around, and the trees start bowing over like this, shaking just like this. R wind roared. The trees stood back up like that. The man said, you think that's a sign? <laughs> I go, that'll work till one comes. So that, that's where, right, right there where that happened is where he built the cabin. So they built a wonderful little cabin by this uh, portal. So the, we're, it's finally done, November. I'm going to dedicate it. My wife is in Texas. I'm there in Moravian Falls at this new cabin. There's the man that built the cabin. We're holding hands because we're dedicating the cabin. And I'm praying, oh, Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for the, you know. And in the middle of the prayer, right behind me are, is a stair going up to the second floor. You hear <laughs> somebody walking up the stairs. Ain't nobody there but me and him. You can hear it as clear as a bell. Heavy footsteps going up the house. He squeezes my hands real hard. <laughs> he said, I got to go home, hadn't I? I said, yes, you do. So he leaves. He gets in his pickup truck, drives down a, a not even a road, a gravel thing where some trucks had been. So he drives off. I'm the only duck on the pond. <laughs> I go back in the house. There's a fire crackling. It's November up in the mountains. So I sit down on the sofa. And I'm just sitting there, and I hear a noise out on the front porch. Nobody else is around there. We are in the secluded Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. So I thought, well, there's nobody supposed to be here. So I get out and open the door and step out on the porch. There's 14 to 18 angels on the porch, dressed exactly like the pilgrims. They have not had a, um, a commission till, since the 1700s. Their first question was, what took you so long? And anyway, so just the, being the mature man of God that I am, I started playing with the angels. This is 94. This is when uh, Toronto was going on. So these angels, they were, you couldn't imagine. They were dressed just like pilgrims, and I'm playing with them. They could, they could jump off the porch, jump back on. They're swinging in a porch. They could swing around a pole. And we're just out there having a time. And well, I don't know, we stayed out there probably 45 minutes, something like that. And then tch, this group got quiet and they're gone. Tch, that group got quiet and they're gone. I'm the only guy standing on the porch now. I thought, oh, man. So I walked back in, sat down on the sofa, stoked up the fire a little. It's crackling, and I'm beating myself up. I thought, how immature. How could I have been out there playing with those angels when I could have been inquiring and getting information? <laughs> Then I'm sitting there. It's dark now. A knock came on the door a lot louder than that. 
my heart jumped all the way up in my throat like a little 16-year-old girl. I said, come in. <laughs> and a voice said, no, you must come out. I get up and my knees were weak. I walk to the front door of that cabin and I open the door. There stands Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Not a trance, not a vision, more real than me standing right here before you. Standing there on my front porch in this cabin with a bottle in his hand, looked just like a champagne bottle. And he said to me, we're going to have a christening service, but you don't know anything about christening. He walked right by me just like this and didn't stop where the fireplace was cracking. He walked down the hallway, turned back to the right where the bedroom was. I'm following him. And he took the bottle and went wham and hit the wall in this cabin. Bottle shatters. An oily substance is running out down the wall just like this. I didn't say it. I thought it. I thought, oh, my. How am I going to explain to the man that built this cabin the first <laughs> night his walls destroyed? I didn't say it. I thought it. You know, the Bible said he knows our thoughts are far off. Yes. The moment I thought it, Jesus looked at me and said, you never have to apologize or attempt to explain what I do. Look. So I looked at the wall and the oil that was running down had made a perfect map of the world. Like a war room map. All the continents, all the nations. And the Lord spent hours touching a place and would light up, touching another place, touching another place. When he touched it, it would light up. He said, you can only target what I target or you'll become a target. Mm -hmm. It lasted for hours. Now here's what I want to tell you. Every hair on my body stood out. I'm talking about every hair on me. Have you seen those machines you can touch it? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> you amplify that about 100%. I'm telling you, this was a life-changing moment. My wife is in Texas praying, Oh, God, give Bobby a visitation. I'm in Moravian Falls going, Oh, God, don't kill Bobby. <laughs> Pretty wild. Oh, here's my notes. And anyway, we'll talk about that this next year's. I'm gonna, I want to be invited back for next year's conference. I'm inviting myself. Yeah. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. You go, well, that's rude. No. That's right. I, I, I'm, I'm coming. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. By that time next year, the whole atmosphere is going to be saturated with an appreciation for the glory of God. Yeah. Between now and then, we're going to fall on our face weeping on how, how casual and how blasé we've been about coming before God. Yes. We'll, we'll, weep, we'll, re, we'll weep tears of anguish, but tears of joy. I'm telling you, it's going to be the strangest thing, but it, we're going to get up from there, and I'm telling you, we're going to see Him in His beauty like we've never seen Him before. Amen. I promise you that. Amen. I promise you that. So anyway, get ready. You say, well, how do I get ready? Purify your heart. Yes. Be holy, ye that bear the Lord. Yes. And I mean, spend time working on being in the right place, doing the right thing. There's so many verses about guarding your eyes. I'll give you a couple of them. Psalms 100 and, uh, 101, verse 3 through 8, it talks about... Don't let anything wicked come before your eyes. And look, look, look what he says there. He says that we got to guard our eyes. Don't you want to guard them? Yes. Say yes. yes. Oh, let me see. There may be some more verses about. Oh, there's a whole ton of them here. Ah, oh, man. Remember I said that about if the light that be in you be darkness, how dense is the darkness? That's Matthew 6, verse 23 through 24. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff in there. Job talks about it. said, I made a covenant with my eyes that I'd not let my eyes drink any pollution in. Wow. Better watch what you watch. You go, oh, well, I'm a consenting adult. It doesn't bother me. You're lying. You're created for it to bother you. Huh. Yeah. You, you don't understand that, do you? You're created for the opposite sex to attract you. It's abnormal to be a homosexual. You ain't even created for that. Look at birds. What's the prettiest bird? The boy. <laughs> Is that right? Yes. I mean, he can fluff some feathers. <laughs> Have you seen him? 
What are they doing? They attracting mama. And so we have to watch it, don't we? So watch out what you watch because you're created to attract one another. Watch how you walk. Watch, how, watch your body language. Watch your cleavage. Do you understand that? Yes. You have to watch it. You go, well, you know. <laughs> My wife and I are counseling a woman. Her husband was an executive in a big company. And Barbara was her name. And she was beautiful, beautiful woman. And sitting in my study, right across from my desk, my wife sitting there in a chair right beside her. Here's what she said. Now, this is a woman in church saying to her pastor, Well, pastor, I like to flirt, but I don't intend to do anything. I just like to see who I can have close to doing something I can do. That's Russian roulette. Now, is that crazy? Yes. It's crazy to tell a pastor that. You understand that? I said, hold on a minute. And I called her husband's office. I said, could you come to my office? Your wife is sitting here, and we've got some things we need to talk about. You know who I blame sometimes? I blame the husbands. They let their wife leave the house looking like a burlesque dancer. Let their daughters dress like that. What are you thinking? You know how people think. We better guard some things. You go, well, now, Bobby, you know. <laughs> no, we're not that aggressive and we're not that, you know. Anyway, I like this guy. Go, go, you're about to go to another level. I'm serious. Now, all, all of us can, but he's heard you cry. And I'll tell you what, what is going to give you that key to the next level is you made a choice when nobody was watching. You could have done one thing, but you did the right thing. Okay? And God keeps an eye on that. You believe if you talk about God a lot, he'll write your name in a book? Yes! yes! Where's that, brother? Malachi. Yes. 316. God says he listens when you talk about him a lot with one another. And he writes your name down and writes a book about it. Malachi 3.16. They that spoke often of the Lord, God listened and he wrote it down in a book. Yeah, we ought to meet in those house groups and talk often about the Lord. Amen. Brag on Jesus. Yeah. Isn't he wonderful? You don't have to die to see him. People, now, I'm going to be as clear as I can. When I say Jesus came to my house, I'm not talking about a trance. I'm telling you Jesus Christ came to my house. I bypassed Jesus once, walked by in a coliseum, and I thought he was a homeless man sitting on the back seat. Yeah, I walked in a coliseum. There are some big-time evangelists down there. All of them's on TV. You've seen every one of them. And so I walked in, and I'm fixing to come down here and, and talk to him. And so I'm walking, and there's a homeless guy, I thought, on the back seat with his head down, hair like that. The Holy Spirit said, go talk to him. I said, nope, I'm going to talk to them. He said, go talk to him. I said, nope, I'm going to talk to them. I'm still walking. I'm coming right at the edge of the Civic Center. I'm going to come down here and fraternize with these guys. Now the fourth or fifth time, the Holy Spirit said, don't go back and talk to him. I said, okay. And I turned on my heels like that, and I walked back there. There he is sitting there. There they are talking, the big guys. Here's this guy, and he's got his head down like that. So I didn't know what to say, so I walked up there, and I tapped him on the shoulder like this. And I said, well, I'm glad you came. He does like this. He said, no, I'm glad you came. It was Jesus Christ. Looked all the way through me with the most piercing eyes you've ever seen. No, I'm glad you came. Wow. Wow. Look out now. So I thought, whoo, and then he disappeared. Mahesh Yavda, y'all know Mahesh? I was preaching for Mahesh once. Matter of fact, this week, this week I'll be down there in uh, Texas ablaze with Mark Sharona, Mahesh Yavda, uh, John Kilpatrick, and uh, uh, Keith Miller. So that'll be good. This week we'll be down there. But anyway, I was at Mahesh's church, and Mahesh is sitting back there on the thing, and I go, I turn around like this. I say, well, Mahesh, 
One day people will be here in this church on their hands and knees picking up diamonds. I turn back around. There's a guy on his hands and knees. He picks up a diamond. It's $30,000 diamond. Wow. Uh -huh. Mahesh's wife, Bonnie, goes, here's one. She picked hers up and put it in her hand. She's going to the camera just like this. And she picked it up and put it like that. And the camera's zeroing in and so everybody up there can see it. And he goes, poof, and disappeared. <laughs> wow. But then I'd, I'd preach and diamonds just fall. Yeah, I'm in a coliseum. There's a funny looking carpet. And I told the diamond story. I said, here's one. I kicked it like that. And it went rolling that way. And a guy, scream, a woman screamed, it's mine. And uh, uh, she had a, 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 a ring with just the tongs sticking up. Okay. But it's supernatural to see a diamond like that, isn't it? Yeah. You want to hear another diamond story? Well, Come on. here we go. I told diamond stories over there in England. And there's a, a, a young man going to marry the preacher's daughter. And I told the story about a diamond. And we're walking back down the hall, and he's a wonderful young man. And the preacher's daughter, we watched her grow up, and they're going to get married. And, and he said to me, he said, oh, Bobby, he said, you told that diamond story. He said, I was so thrilled, and I looked so hard to see if I could find one. He said, uh, I had to buy our wedding ring, and the only thing I could get, uh, uh, listen, I'm telling you, it was, it was little. <laughs> but it was all he could get for his wife, a little bitty. And I said, oh, I said, I, I, I wish God would have dropped you a big one. But we didn't see any diamonds or anything, so I thought, oh, man. So they get married. He puts a little bitty ring on her finger. They go off to a honeymoon and I think they're two days at a honeymoon and they come back to the little house they had uh, uh, leased and they get ready to go to bed the first night in their own home. Flip back the covers. Guess what's laying there? A rose cut diamond. I mean it's big as a marble. You ought to see it on her finger. Jeweler, jewelers say there's hardly any way to tell the value of it because of the perfection of it and the color of it. Wow. Yeah. My wife who wants to shout No. <laughs> no, listen. But can you imagine that? Wow. But God did it uh, on his own timing. But I like, I like when stuff like that happens, don't you? Yes. And I don't want anything happening. I can't understand. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> you better get to a graveyard. <laughs> Everybody goes, I want things done in decency and in order. That's a graveyard. <laughs> I like life, don't you? Yes. I like it where it's spontaneous. Yes. Spontaneous, that's it, you know. I, I don't like things that are just rigid. Yes. Kind of chill out. Yes. <laughs> I just don't know how to tell you, but I entertain myself. <laughs> Honestly. I'm laying in bed one night, and I wake up, and the whole room is spinning around. I mean, listen, it is just wonderful. I said, oh, God, what is this? He said, take your hand off your head. You know, <laughs> I went to sleep and put my hand on my head, and I was anointing myself while I was asleep. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to ask my wife when she comes. The Holy Ghost used to come get in bed with us. I, now, that sounds crude, but Holy Ghost would come get in bed with us, and you could run your hand like this, and blue fire would jump out of me. <laughs> and we'd lay there and play like this. Holy Ghost would start at your feet, rolling up, up, just like this. Roll all the way up, and then roll all the way down. My wife said we were stupid for sleeping, you know. It was a visitation. It, listen, I don't want a God you can't feel. You know what one guy told me? He said, well, I'll tell you now, brother. I don't want to get my people into anything they can't understand. I said, I don't understand electricity. I ain't sitting in the dark till I do. <laughs> do you? I don't know how a microwave works. Did I tell y'all about that? It's 1 o'clock. <laughs> my wife had bought some turkey weenies. Turkey weenies. <laughs> so, here's what happened. I was going to uh, fix the boy something to eat, and I put these turkey weenies in the microwave, and I, just for a few seconds, and I'm trying to get some paper plates, and I turn back around, and good Lord, those turkey weenies had started, now they're this big around. 
I mean, they've doubled or tripled or quadrupled in size. Now there's a whole plate full of big turkey weenies. I thought that's going to be a good budget item. Buy those little turkey weenies and then blow them up and let the kids eat them. So I'm thinking about what a wonderful plan that is. The microwave goes off, so I'm trying to get out some mustard and some stuff for the boys to squirt on those turkey weenies. I turn around, they deflated. <laughs> they look like an old woman's little finger. And they turned into something like jerky. You couldn't rub them in two, you'd have to... Yeah. Oh, man. You don't want me cooking. I'll tell you, this I'm through. No, I'm not. I was sitting in our house once, and I was sitting there, and I go, my wife's sitting over there in a chair, and she goes, what are you doing? I go, she said, what are you doing? I said, uh, I'm smelling homemade cookies. She said to me, I'll tell you one thing, I am not baking you cookies. Yeah. So at that time, I was 73, I'm 75 now. So I thought to myself, good God, I'm 73 years old. I can bake a cookie. So I decided to bake my own cookie. This is true now. So I got me a box of oatmeal. I got me a pan about that big, and I poured the oatmeal in there, a box of oatmeal. And then I get to looking on the box, and it says four eggs. I break four eggs in there. And then it says this and that. And, but then it is said you're supposed to mix it. So there it is. So I put peanut butter in it. And then uh, that didn't work, so I poured olive oil in it. And then I got down to the bottom where it says, preheat oven to what? 250 or 450, whatever it was. So I thought, oh, Lord, I hadn't even preheated the oven, so I turned her wide open. 550 or whatever it'd get up to. Cremate just about it. And see, my cookies won't stick together because it's olive oil. And, and then I poured in some cranberries I found in the cupboard so instead of being like that they got like they're not quite as big as a softball but about the size of a baseball and so I, the oven's just going so I um, got to, it says put on a buttered bake sheet or whatever so I thought I don't have no butter so I poured olive oil all over it I got the thing out and I put my I put my, they're the size of a basketball. So I put them, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. I mean, I had a whole box of oatmeal. I slid that in the oven like this, and oh my goodness. It's real hot, and those, those, those balls go up like this, and then they go down like that. I made me one cookie about that thick, about that long, and about that big. The rest of it ran down the, the bottom of the thing. But I, listen to me, honestly. They never got crisp. They got flexible. You, honestly, but now you're not going to believe it. They were wonderful. You, they never would crunch. Then you just have to chew them till they got wet enough to swallow. But, uh, Honestly, and they were just uh, pliable like uh, Play-Doh. But they had the best flavor you could have. And then my wife, she says, what did you put in here? I said, well, I put the oatmeal, I put the, oat, I put the peanut butter, I put the olive oil. And she said, what's them brown things? I said, cranberries. She said, you didn't get them out of the cabinet, did you? I said, yes. She said, that was for the birds. They had mildew on them. I mean, listen, medicinal, you know. <laughs> they grow penicillin with, <laughs> yeah. See? Did you still eat them, Bobby? No, I tell you, I, they were good, though. Let me tell you, though. Did you eat them? 
I figured that 100, uh, 500 something degrees killed anything in that mildew. <laughs> but I'll tell you what has happened. I told the story so many times. People have sympathy for me. I get bags of cookies, boxes of cookies. It's crazy. But my wife don't want me to eat cookies. But uh, I've been trying to convince the venture that carrot cake is a vegetable. <laughs> you think? Yeah. Most time I'll, in, when I'll invite myself to come preaching and I'll invite somebody to cook for me. Yeah. I usually pick out one of the best cooks in the house and I'll go, I'm coming to your house to eat. I got so many stories. Yeah. Let me take one more story about it. I'm in the Houston Coliseum preaching. I never stay up there. You know what I mean. So I'm up there preaching. There's a guy in a suit, like an Armani suit, and there's his wife sitting there. And I walked by, and I wheeled around to that woman. I said, hey, I'm going to your house to eat. Where do you live? <laughs> That's what I said. Houston Coliseum. The husband, he's, he's, he's distinguished looking. She looked at me. She said, here's what she said. You ready? In a God-forsaken place you've never heard of. Wow. Her husband stiffened like that. I said, no, I'm going to your house to eat. Where do you live? She said it again. In a God-forsaken place you've never heard of. Her husband's really apologetic looking. I'm not letting it go. I'm going to your house to eat. Where do you live? Third time. In a God-forsaken place. I said, no, tell me where you live. Now, here's the problem. I didn't know. He was an executive for the Exxon Oil Company. They lived on the country club in Houston. But his whole dream was to go back to the family farm and redo the old farmhouse and move his wife up there. She hated up there. She wanted the country club life, but he was determined to redo the farmhouse and move up there. So, fourth time, where do you live? She said, Canard! I like to have fainted. Canard's a little bump in the road away out in the country, of miles from where we're at in that Coliseum. So, she said, Cunard, I like to have fainted. I said to Joe DeVilla, he was our assistant, I said, Hey, Joe, run up there on the pulpit and get me my, my calendar. He runs up there and gets my calendar. And I said, Bring it here. He ran and gave me the calendar. I said, Ma'am, would you read where I'm going to be this coming Friday night? Guess where I was going to be? Canard. The gymnasium in Cunard, Texas. <laughs> Preaching in the gymnasium. Guess where I ate? I ate at the woman's house. You know why? They ain't no God forsaken place God don't know about. See, are you in that right place with God? Are you in that gym? Don't be like David. Don't make up your mind, well, it doesn't matter where I am. It does matter where you're at. Make sure you're following the Holy Ghost to be in the right place at the right time for the right reason. That's where I nearly got my finger bit off by a parrot. I'm sitting at Canard eating with me and my wife and that executive and his wife. And I'm, well, they've got a beautiful, it's a nice place. And I'm cutting on a piece of steak, you know. And I hear something in the next room go, Rah! I thought, demon, that's probably what that was. So I said to the woman, I said, what's that? She says, that's my parrot. Now, I'm inquisitive. I excuse myself from the dinner table. I'm going out to see the parrot. I'm not exaggerating. That parrot was as long as from here down to the floor. I'm talking about a parrot this long with a head about that big around. Green, yellow, green looking, sitting on a perch about this big around. <laughs> when I walked in, he cut his eye over there at me and go, <laughs> Now, I, I, I'm up for a challenge. I said to myself, I'm going to poke that parrot. <laughs> See, I told you I entertained myself. Here's that parrot. Instead of going that way in the cage, he's coming over there towards me. <laughs> he's giving me the evil I'm in. I'm saying, okay, you come here. I'm fixing to poke you. That's my prophetic finger. I pull it back just like that. I'm fixing to poke that bird. Just as I start like that, she opens the door. Now, I can't say exactly what she said, but like something like, Shucks! <laughs> Don't do it! He'll bite your blessed finger off! <laughs> sort of like that. So I jerked my, you know, I didn't want to lose my finger. The parrot's still going, yeah. <laughs> anyway, 
I said, he'll bite my finger off. She says, yes. She said, watch. And she had some of them sticks like he's sitting on. They're about not as big as a mop handle, but she picked it up and stuck it in there. He goes, ta -ta. I go, good. Yeah. I went back in there and ate my steak and tried to behave myself. <laughs> but I want you to start enjoying what you do. Don't drag through life. Oh, no, it's a dawning of a new day. Amen. Psalms 30, verse 5. Weeping may last through the night. Joy comes in the morning. Amen. So be at the right place for the right reason. I want to pray for you, okay? I pray, Lord, that you will activate our internal GPS, that we will follow the grand plan of God, that we'll not be doing our own thing, we'll be following you. We'll follow the Lamb wherever he goes. We'll do what he asks us to do. We'll obey you, and we'll say, God, I'm not my own. I'm yours. I know your plans for me are better than I could make for myself, and I choose your will, not my will. That's what Jesus said. Not my will be done, but thy will be done. And that's what you want, isn't it? When God's will's done, it's marvelous. Yeah. He always has a better plan than you make for yourself. Yeah. You, want a, you want a verse? Sure, Bobby. Here it is. Jeremiah 31, 17. Jeremiah 31, 17 says, Your future is filled with bright hope. Amen. You won't get that on CNN, will you? Okay. Okay, Joe, we've got to get out of here. God bless you.